Okay, here we go. So we have two hours on the battery. So we're gonna we're gonna talk for two hours about underwriting. I hope you're all excited about it. I hope you're ready for it. All right, two hours of underwriting. All right. So um, underwriting uh, starts with the agent, the, the primary contact that the customer has with the insurance company. Okay, and so obviously we talked just before we quit last time we talked about putting together an underwriting policy that uh, must be available to everyone in the company so that people understand the type of business that the company is taking on okay and that the agent has to be familiar with that they have to know it's called qualifying a prospect the job of the agent is to go out there and get business okay and so the agent has to know who he or she can call on uh, and who they need to stay away from, okay? Sometimes it's hard to know, but you can, you can cold call somebody, ask them a couple of questions on the front end, and either and de determine right then and there, this is somebody I want to pursue, or this is not someone that, that our company wants to do business with, so it's time to move on, okay? So one thing the agent does, and this, this was farther down in the notes, now it's, I just moved it up here, is they're going to do a preliminary report, and they'll submit that report to the underwriter. So the agent gets the process started, and the agent is the liaison between the underwriting department and the client, okay, making sure that um, the agent makes sure that, the, that he gets or he or she gets all the reports to the client, make sure the client fills them out properly and gets those reports back to uh, the underwriting group. All right. So underwriting gets most of their information from the application. Okay, the application for the insurance. And man, I can tell you firsthand, when I worked at a big company as a partner, I didn't do any paperwork. Okay, all I did was manage portfolios and meet with clients. And when I opened my own firm, I had to come familiar with all the paperwork, and it's it's just a pain. It is not fun. It is time consuming. And, um, you know, if my little company gets much bigger, I might have to have uh, somebody at least half time just to do the paperwork for me. Okay? So there's always, there are always applications. And you know, you've been into a doctor's office and you know all the forms that you have to fill in. And every time you go to a different doctor, you have to fill in the same forms. You kind of wish that there was some central repository of information so that you didn't have to fill in, you didn't have to spend 15 minutes filling in the same stuff every doctor's office you go into. All right. So, uh, for property in, in, uh, insurance, you need a legal description. Okay, so there is a document that will give you a legal description of your property. Okay, and that's different from saying, well, it's a house at 23 Harding Drive. No, that is not a legal description. Okay. Um, a physical description of the house. And... Um, so that, these are detailed descriptions, including lists of materials. One of my clients called me. She was very angry. Her State Farm agent, I hadn't called on her in a long time, and she had uh, a leak in her house, and she looked, at her, um, she looked at her application, and it was all wrong. The description of the materials in her house were all wrong. She wasn't happy about that, and she, she switched agents. It's really interesting. Okay. For commercial, you want to know who's in the building, okay, and what do they do. I've developed a handful of buildings, business uh, uh, buildings, offices, and we've had a variety of different businesses in there, ranging from... Um, uh, a laser hair removal to um, a dentist and an oral surgeon, okay, to a restaurant. And the, you know, the, the insurance on your building depends on who's in your building and what they do, okay? And you can, when you start thinking about putting in those different types of, of um, businesses in an office building, you put in anything that's medical, and man, you got all sorts of special things that have to go into the building, and coverages that you have to have and that the, that the doctor has to have, 
Okay. All right. So the company, the insurance company, is going to send out somebody to do an on-site inspection, or they're going to employ someone to come out and do an on-site inspection. Okay. Whoops. What happened? Where am I? There we go. Okay. For life insurance, this really needs to be on the other slide, but for life insurance, it includes personal information on the application. Okay. These are things that um, will, will affect the lifespan of someone. So their gender. Okay. So what can you tell me about gender? How does gender affect lifespan? You know? Women typically have a longer lifespan. Yeah, women live longer by a couple of years. Okay? So your age, okay, that's going to affect your lifespan. Okay? Your weight, okay? I know two people. I know one guy who they found he had stomach cancer. They thought he had an ulcer a bleeding ulcer, and they went in to repair it, and he had stomach cancer, and it was stage four. He never came out of the hospital, and he died. He did not have life insurance because he could not get life insurance because he was obese. He was an all-state basketball player in high school, and he became obese, and he couldn't get life insurance. And I have a friend right now who is now on disability, and he is obese, and he has no life insurance because of his weight. Okay, um, and then your 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 personal history and your family history. Okay, <clears throat> so I know in the United States we talk a lot about being in shape, man, being in shape, and yeah, that's that's important. But if you have tough genes in your family, you can be in great shape. And it's hard to overcome those genes. You know, I'm not, I'm not discouraging you from being in shape, but I'm telling you that if you have problems on both sides of your family, and I do, man, you can be in the best shape ever. And you could have, you could have a break. That's what this is. That's what this is. It's, it runs on my mom's side of the family. My mom had it. Her sister had it. Her mother had it. Don't know who else had it. One of my cousins has it. It's, it's an autoimmune disease. My mom also had psoriasis, which is an autoimmune disease. It's when your immune system attacks your own body. All right. Um, do you fly a plane? Okay. If you fly a plane, your life insurance rates go way up. Okay. Do you jump out of planes? <laughs> Your life insurance is going to go way up. If you're a crop duster, you probably can't get life insurance. That's the most dangerous profession on the planet, being a crop duster. Okay? And we had a student whose dad was a crop duster, and he survived the crash. He did survive a crash. All right. And also, they look at the amount of insurance that is being asked for. Hey, I make $50,000 a year. I'd like $5 million worth of life insurance. Woo-wee. You better be getting an inheritance because at $50,000 a year, we're not giving you $5 million worth of life insurance because that is a moral hazard. All right. Life insurance applicants also have to submit to a physical exam. Okay. And um, I've done that several times. It's usually done by a nurse that they send out to you. I've had it done in my office twice. And what they do is they take blood, they take a urine sample, they take your blood pressure, they listen to you breathe, and they do an EKG. That, that's all they do, okay? It takes 10 minutes. Uh, but then they refer to the Medical Insurance Bureau, okay, to see about you, your medical conditions, your prescription medication history. So if you're taking prescription medication for hypertension, you know, high blood pressure, which I do, never thought I would, okay? But I've been taking it for like 
three years for, and I take medication for um, cholesterol. Okay? And my blood pressure is great, below, below average, and my cholesterol is low. The doctor said, you're not going to change your diet, are you? And I said, heck no. I'm eating fried chicken every, fr every Wednesday at KJ's. He said, okay, we're putting you on a stack. I'm like, okay, because I'm not going to stop. You know, if it gets me, it gets me. All right. So, um, these are reports that um, the insurance company um, has access to. Okay. So, it's a big association. All these companies share your information, which is fair, you know. I will say this with the new Supreme Court nominee. I am concerned about her position on the Affordable Care Act and particularly about pre-existing conditions. Okay? I, I, I think that um, it's a good thing that, that the law prohibits insurance companies from denying coverage to someone with pre-existing conditions. Okay? Because people need the coverage and we're pooling and, and uh, I hope they won't strike that down. And they say that she, in general, there were certain portions of the Affordable Care Act that she was opposed to. And so I want to hear what her position is on that. All right. Okay. So we'll get into errors that are committed by either the insurance company or by the customer when filling out the applications, not in this chapter, but in another chapter, and whether those errors are intentional or unintentional, and what impact they have on your insurance. But the bottom line is, you got to be honest when you fill out an application. And if they're going to find out if you lie about something. If you have a heart condition or suicidal tendencies or whatever, you got to come clean on that. Otherwise, you, know, you could something bad could happen to you, and your coverage could be denied to your um, beneficiaries. So you don't want that to happen. All right. So after reviewing the information, the underwriter has three options: accept it, accept the application, okay, and the, the loss exposure will be covered, okay, or Accept the application subject to restrictions, exclusions, pricing, or other modifications. So they might say, we're going to cover this, we're going to, but we're, we're going to, we found this, and we're going to exclude it from your coverage. This one thing is going to be excluded. Yeah? Is that saying, like, for life insurance, that if this person dies while doing this, then you're not going to get covered? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, so they could exclude something, or they could say, all right, we'll cover it, but your pricing is going to reflect that. So what do you want to do? So if you, want, if you die flying in a plane that you are piloting, you or someone in your family is piloting, we're not going to cover it. Okay? Or we will cover it, but instead of paying um, $2,500 per year for a $500,000 policy, you're going to pay $10,000 per year for a $500,000 policy if you want to cover Okay? So they don't have to say no. They can say yes, but. Or reject the application. Say no, we're not interested. This does not fit what we're trying to do. I'm sure someone else is out there who will write coverage for you, but not us. It just doesn't fit with what we're trying to do. Okay? All right. So other things you look at when you're in underwriting from a high altitude strategically, we've already talked about it, is making sure that your rates are adequate to provide, uh, to pay for expenses and a, a, a profit. Making sure that you minimize the amount of moral hazard that's involved with the policy. You don't want to give someone coverage, and that coverage gives them a reason to do something bad. That's what moral hazard is. Okay, so you have to weigh that out. What will the impact of this policy be? 
And I'm telling you, there were uh, there was there were several schemes, particularly out in California, where people um, would hook up with homeless people and get and pay them to take out an insurance policy, then they'd murder them. It happened. It happened. All right. Um, what's going on uh, with the underwriting site when you when you decide if you're going to accept or reject and how to price it? You know what's happening out there with your underwriting cycle is is it hard cycle or a soft cycle? All right, um, your ability to get reinsurance and how much it will cost you will determine how much insurance you write and what you're going to charge on the insurance. So. He was talking about reinsurance, and we're going to talk a good bit about reinsurance in this class, but reinsurance simply is when one insurance company shifts part of their risk, transfers it to another insurance company, and they pay a premium to the other insurance company. And I, he did a great job of laying out how insurance companies pick and choose what levels of risk they want to take on. I thought he did a great job with that. All right. Um, one thing that underwriting has to do, and this this has to do primarily with property casualty insurance. Okay, well, only with property casualty insurance. Maybe may li li other types of liability insurance, but not life insurance. Is should we renew a um, a policy? And what? Who's affected most? frequently by this. What kind of policy? Automobile. Man, you had your fourth accident in 18 months or speeding ticket, you could get your um, your automobile insurance canceled. The company just says, I've had enough of this. You're a bad risk, you're not paying attention, and you know, we're not gonna cover you anymore. Okay? That happens. If you're a business that's had a number of fires, they're done with you. If you're a homeowner and you just keep having claim after claim after claim, they're done with you. Okay? So remember this. When you have an accident, or if you file one claim too many on your, on your homeowner's insurance, they, they will probably renew your policy, but your rate's going to go up. Your rate's going to go up. And my son had a little fender bender, and I said, you're going to pay the deductible on that thing. And I'll pay the, the increase in insurance rates, but if it happens again, you're not only going to pay the deductible, you're going to pay the increase in the insurance rates. Because, you know, I want you, you got to slow down. He's a crazy driver. All right. Once a life policy is issued, it cannot be canceled unless the applicant has committed fraud. And we will discuss what fraud is. There are different types of fraud, and we'll discuss that. But that's the only, that's the only thing, unless, some, unless there's an exclusion in the policy. And we'll discuss... Uh, waivers and things like that in life insurance policies. Okay? So that's why when the insurance company makes that, when they make the offer to the customer, they got to know they're willing to stand by it. It's a big decision. Because once you extend life insurance to somebody, as long as they pay their premiums, and as long as they don't commit fraud on the application, you, they can't. They can't be canceled down the road. They get cancer, the insurance company can't cancel their life insurance policy. Okay? And it used to be if you got cancer while you were working with somebody and you lost that job and you went to work somewhere else, you couldn't get health insurance. And that's what I'm talking about, pre-existing condition. And that's why we needed that, um, that law, that portion of the Affordable Care Act. People should not be kicked out of the insurance system because they get something that they didn't contribute to. Alright. Okay, we've already talked about this in the last chapter. Production. 
Production in the insurance business refers to sales and marketing. Whoops, we've already, <laughs> we've already talked about that. And so, in the financial services business in general, salesmen are referred to as producers. And what you find is that people who sell a lot have a lot of influence in the company. <laughs> you get your way. You get a lot of perks. You ride on the company plane a lot. And you, go, you play golf at the, uh, at the Elotion a lot when you're a, um, a big producer. All right. There are special agents at the property and liability companies that help the, the agents out in the field understand the products and the platform and help them with marketing. You know, they might come in from the home office to help close a big deal. Okay, so there are people who do that, experts who do that. All right. Now, insurance marketing, who, has anybody seen, um, uh, what's the name of that um, movie with Bill Murray? Um, Groundhog Day. Anybody see Groundhog Day? No? Great, yeah. Remember Ned? Remember the insurance agent? Okay, no, it was a... Well, a while. He, yeah, well, one of, his, one of his buddies from high school shows up. Ned, something or other, he's now a life insurance agent. And every time Bill Murray wakes up at some point during the day, he runs into Ned. And so he figures out different ways to turn Ned off. At one point, Ned comes up and says, at the same spot every day, and he says, you know, Bill, man, it's Ned, blah, blah, blah. And at one point, Bill Murray turns around and puts a big bear hug, and he says, let's go have a drink. And Ned goes, ah, and he goes around and away. He's trying to figure out how to get Ned away from him. Stop bugging me. I'm not going to buy life insurance from you. Okay? But insurance has become, um, insurance marketing has become a lot more professional. As you saw yesterday. Okay? All right. So there, there is a lot of technical training that you, that you get, and you have to learn about the products, okay? It's not that hard, depending on what it is you're going to do, okay? And you're required to be a fiduciary, which means that you, this is a legal term, we talked about it in the investment business, you have to put the client's interest first. You don't sell the client something that makes you a lot of money, but it's really not what's best for the client. The client can sue you and you will lose. The burden of proof is on you, not on the client. Okay? You have to defend, you have to prove that what you sold the client is what's best for the client. The client doesn't have to prove it. You do, and that's much tougher in court of law. Okay? So, this is, I added a lot of information here, so you're going to have to write this down. Several organizations have developed professional programs, designation programs for insurance. Okay? So here's, this is a biggie. The CLU, the Chartered Life Underwriter. 